Date with a Debut is a Words and Nerds and Breathe Art Podcasts co-production recorded on a Wapical country. And I pay my respects to all elders, past and present, and extend that to any First Nations people tuning in. Always was, always will be, Aboriginal land. On with the show. Welcome to Date With A Debut, a podcast about debut authors, their incredible books, and their journey to publication. If you are looking for a new author to discover or writing inspiration for your own story and you don't know where to start, this is the place to be. I'm Nick Wasiliev, author of When Men Cry and your host for today's show, and I'm delighted to welcome another debut author in today's episode. If you enjoy the show or indeed any other shows on the Words and Nerds platform, jump online and give us a thumbs up five-star review wherever you are listening. Thank you for listening to us and for supporting the Australian book industry. You can also find any books mentioned in today's podcast down in the description. Today I'm joined by Michelle C. Foe, who is a freelance writer and copywriter. She's had articles and works published in Kill Your Darlings, Mianjin, Overland and the Big Issue Fiction Edition. However, we're here today to talk about her debut novel, Jade and Emerald, which is published by Penguin Random House and also was the recipient of the 2023 Penguin Literary Prize. I started off by asking Michelle about her experience of writing the book, but also about the incredible honour of picking up such a prestigious literary prize. Michelle, welcome to Date with a Debut. Hi, it's good to be here. I am speaking to you from um, Boonwurrung land. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad that I get to talk to you about this beautiful book that you have written, Jade and Emerald. And before I begin, and before we dive headlong into this story, uh, I just want to highlight a flex that you have, uh, which is the <laughs> fact <laughs> that your this book Oh, this manuscript won the 2023 Penguin Literacy Prize. Um, first up, congrats. That is a very amazing, prestigious, crazy award to win and pick up. Uh, does it pinch yourself? Uh, do you pinch yourself a little bit the moment that you won that award? But not only that, that this manuscript that you picked, that you award, that you won, is now about to come out and be in the hands of readers? Um, well, first of all, thank you. That's um, very, very kind of you. Um, <laughs> I I do, yeah, um, because uh, I suppose for a while I had been, um, when I had first written the manuscript, I had been pitching it out to um, a bunch of places, like I don't even know how many. Um, I've lost count of the amount of rejections. Um, <laughs> so, so when I got shortlisted for um, the Penguin Literary Prize, I didn't I didn't really kind of like I, I was like like yeah in a lot of shock about it because I just didn't expect it like it's imposter like, oh, syndrome already been, yeah yeah like <laughs> even when I entered it I was just like oh here's another prize that's going to reject me <laughs> <laughs> it, it's so true and it's like it, I think every author has to have that like it's very more often the case than not that you have that rite of passage of of applying and, and submitting your manuscript to a hundred places and everyone going no no, no. and then out of nowhere <laughs> someone says yes out of nowhere and then it's just a hundred miles an hour uh, in, yeah. In <laughs> yeah, and it, and it happens when you least expect it as well because, yeah, you know, some of the time you'd be, like, really hanging your hopes on something and then it wouldn't happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Winning it um, was absurd as well because I I thought, yeah, being shortlisted was amazing, but I was like, that that's going to be where it ends. Um, and um, I, I happened to be, like, freelancing in, in an office um, when um, I, I got an email from um, Meredith Kono at um, Penguin Random House saying, oh, like, can you call me? And just, like for the whole rest of the meeting, I was not at all paying attention because <laughs> I was just like, oh, I have to go and like call Meredith. And I, I, I went outside to call her and then she was like, oh, you know, I wanted to talk to you because um, you won the Penguin Prize. And I, and I was like, <laughs> like I kind of like I couldn't say anything because I, <laughs> I was in shock. 
<laughs> yeah, I imagine like picking that up in a meeting that you'd be like, this is the longest meeting in my entire life now because yeah, now I'm just. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever, it ha however it has come together, it results in this gorgeous, amazing book that I think you should be super proud of straight off by the bat. It's a, it's really an incredible story. And we always like to start these podcasts with the classic elevator pitch. And I know that this is your first uh, audio podcast. Um, so I always, when it's always like some people are, are down with it off the bat. Some people are like, let's try and nail this. So I want you to, to hit me with it. What is for our listeners, the one minute pitch for Jade and Emerald? Um, Jade and Emerald is the story of Leiling Wen. Uh, she's a lonely and bored protein girl. Um, then she meets Gigi Nu, who's the socialite aunt of her classmate. Um, and the two of them form um, an unlikely bond. But that further strains her relationship with her mother, who's already very strict and and they already kind of have quite a tense relationship. So. Mm. Great. Nailed it. Whoa, jeez. <laughs> I always love it when it's like straight to the point. Bam. There is, <laughs> there is so much to uh, digest and unpack in this book, which I love, uh, first and foremost. There's always like the small little threads and ideas that come through. And, and the first thing is that it's very much a story about um, it's the migrant experience set within the framework of a coming of age story. Uh, which um, which I feel like we haven't seen enough of. I mean, we've been exposed. There is a lot more, um, oh, there's a lot more uh, storytelling and perspectives coming out. You know, we've, we've seen it in the last couple of years coming out of, of you know, Southeast Asia, Chinese, Malaysian uh, storytellers with, uh, with incredible books. I mean, we had one recently last year called The Albatross, um, which came mm. out. Um, to, which we had, the, which was around the framework of a romance story, um, and then of course there's a lot of massive movies out there, like of course Crazy Rich Asians, which went everywhere, um, you know, different within a different context. But a coming of age story. Um, immediately, I was I was very much drawn to this, uh, particularly around this this experience, the the contrasting experience that. Gigi and Liling kind of come into when they meet each other. Uh, please tell me about like I got the sense that you were really touching on some some real personal stuff here with this migrant experience, but also just the contrast of the family and also trying to fit into the world that is Australia, which often can be a very hard line to straddle for many people who arrive in Australia? There's a lot of things there. Um, so I guess, um, you know, kind of there's the main sort of touch points of like Leiling sort of trying to fit in at school, um, the, the very basic things like people getting her name wrong or um, mm. being bullied for what she looks like, then the foods that they eat as well, which... Um, other sort of connection that the mother brings from Malaysia. Mm. So yeah, pretty much all the food is like Chinese Malaysian that she cooks at home. Um, then there's also kind of the contrast between Leiling and Angela because Angela is also a Chinese Malaysian background, but um, she's popular. Like everybody at school loves her. She's um, revered for, I guess, what they think is exotic. Um, and like, meanwhile, Leiling's bullied. So it's kind of like, I I guess I felt like, like it was kind of an interesting contrast to do that where like, it, it's not like blatantly, you know, that people are racist. It's that like, there's some people fit in better than others. Like even when you're from the same background. Mm, well, that, I found that contrast immediately straight off the bat, really, really interesting. Or even down to the fact that the, around names was very interesting. I mean, Angela Ooh. and the name that she had uh, that that everyone calls her or refers mm. to her as um, compared to Leiling, even immediately, I think says so much, which is about, you know, it's, it's about, well, there's a particular environment and you fit in this particular environment in a certain way, shape or form. And it, it no wonder Leiling feels so lonely. 
that um and you really capture that beautifully just you are really rooting for her in this story because she's just yearning for that sense of connection and belonging but also not just the fact that she is uh, very much tied to a fam to a family that is very much holding on to those uh, important traditions and values and and it comes through in everything in the relationship at home in the food in the way they speak to one another um and then it contrasts insanely with with this world of, of fitting into Australian society mm -hmm. and that world. And normally I like to go, I like to dive in like the characters separately, but in this particular book, I have to kind of be a little bit different because, you know, the, the, the dynamic that Leeling has with her mother and the family dynamic at home is very different to what happens when she meets Gigi. Um, mm. Because Gigi kind of, she, she see, she kind of sees she's very much in the this glamorous uh, world of kind of wealthy of wealthy australia and uh, her decision to kind of adopt Layling like kind of as a protege and, a, and as someone as that she, that she can take under her wing i just found that contrast so interesting first of all tell me a little bit about Gigi because she is a really important part of this story but why did it feel like she was such a, a a valuable lens to explore expose Layling to this particular world uh, that you wanted to encapsulate well Gigi I guess is yeah she is that kind of crazy rich Asian um so-called um I know I know it feels like <laughs> such a stereotype to boil it down to crazy rich Asian mm. but it just it just it there is it's so fascinating just seeing the examination of that world yeah, well, I mean, it is true that um, in Malaysia there is kind of a subset of people who are um, uber wealthy. And then, of course, like the gap um, between rich and poor is, is very wide. Um, and so so we do kind of have that with like between Gigi and the mother. And um, Leiling even says at one point that like Gigi's description of Malaysia doesn't fit her mother's description of Malaysia mm. because um her, just that their two experiences are just different um and and i mean that's probably true for a lot of countries um it's just that yeah um so there was that kind of contrast between the the two women and their approaches to life so gg believes that you know life is for for living and for excitement while the mother is kind of like she is just working to survive because she, you know, she's sort of been struggling. She's a single mom. Um, she had to raise Leiling by herself in a country where she didn't really speak the language. Um, she didn't know anyone. And so, you know, she's kind of holding down like two jobs, sort of trying to, you know, make the best of her life here because like she believed that she would have a better life in Australia and that her daughter would have a better life in Australia. Mm. Her the mindset of the two of the two women, I think, is is very telling of the backgrounds that they come from. Uh, mm. Because uh, this was another th thought. Because we have because we have this contrast through the through the lens of, of Layling. Um, Gigi has the permission to, like you say, like say life is for living and life is growing because she has grown up in an environment of plenty and grown up in an environment very much where if you want it, you can get it. If you want it, mm. you can have it, um, which is completely at contrast to the family dynamic that Li Ling has at home. Tell me a little bit about her mother because it, and also particularly this very particular mother-daughter relationship that I think you encapsulate very clearly here. Um, like is as much as it as it is a relationship filled with lots of tension and uh, examinations of of power dynamics and very much uh, framed within the context of the culture that uh, that the mother has come out has come from. There is also a beauty to it and a, and a very strong love. Oh, I'm really glad that that comes across because, um, yeah, that's kind of what I was trying to do with the book. So that's really nice to hear. Um, yeah, um, the 
I guess the the mother is very very strict on um, Leiling as kind of like sort of one of the first um, impressions that we have of her that you know she doesn't like she sort of puts a time limit on her daughter to go to a party she's um, you know she takes away all her toys that she um, doesn't let her kind of go out with her friends after school or anything like that um, yeah she is she's very strict and that's kind of um, that does come from like the Malaysian mindset um, like you know kind of hard work but it's also a migrant mindset of like you know like we I've picked up like my entire life and brought you to like another country um, that like you kind of have to like make make use of it mm. like um yeah like that her mother has like sacrificed so much for her but i think obviously Leiling doesn't see it that way but um like what the mother wants is for her to kind of like make the most of um the life that she's trying to build for her mm. there's no safety net there's also that there's kind of the yeah. it's not you're not in a situation where you are surrounded by family you're in a, a different country with a lot of people that you don't know and so you are naturally going to be um mm, mm. not just a lot more protective but mm. uh, a lot more um tr tr making sure that you recognize that you are a rung a, like a rung on a ladder and your mm. and the aim is to make your child um be in a higher place in a higher position in a better more comfortable place to enjoy their life more than you can with yours that is the the priority but of course how that comes across it can be <laughs> yeah it, it's it's it can often be at the at, at a detriment to leeling mm. because it means that it is just a, such a, a rigid environment that allows no room necessarily for play or for um at a time of course as we say bringing it back to what this this is about really much a coming of age growing story where she is coming into her own as a young woman. There is a part of this story which kind of leads quite nicely onto this, which is I want to keep this as spoiler-free as, as I can because the ending, like later in the story, there is a big, uh, this, uh, something very big happens. <laughs> um, and, and I think it's a great examination of i don't know maybe it's if it's just if it's just come at a point in my own life where my parents are getting older and you start to examine you you start to ask more questions uh, as you become an adult yourself about what your parents got up to before you came along um and what was the world of your because they're they're just human beings like you and you realize that you know as you're getting closer to you know having a family of your own or you know getting partners, doing whatever, starting a career that, that oh, yeah, they, they were just, like, winging it like me or doing whatever like me. And I like what you did here as more revelations come to light, that you examine, eight, examine the world. Like many children when you're young, you don't even think that your, your parents were just always there mm. and you never thought of, you never thought that they actually had a whole life before you came along you, you don't even question it it's just like mum mm. is there dad is there <laughs> whoever is there uh and you never think about it and i love that you kind of that leeling has to examine this and even so you do it still through the lens of the fact that she's still a child she is still growing up yeah this is a really great question um i think that many most people look at parents and and like you say that they've just always been there um and and I think people tend to see their parents as like like you know they're there they exist only to like serve us <laughs> um and then, and then like you know we don't kind of understand them as like people we just see them as parents um <laughs> there's a there's a quote from um, Friends. Um, Rachel says, why can't parents just stay parents? Why do they have yeah. to become people? Mm. And, um, yeah, and I did kind of really, like, enjoy kind of exploring, like, the mother as being this whole person outside of um, her life with her daughter. But I guess because the book is um, from Leiling's perspective, you only kind of see, like, the, like, the snippets and then what, her mother tells her so 
um, you know, it's all like filtered through the lens of Leiling kind of, uh, um, you know, not really understanding why her mother is behaving in certain ways. Um, like she doesn't really kind of get those nuances. And then as I say, we'll, we all keep it spoiler free, but in yes. that moment, she, it's a big shock for her. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It, it's, uh, I, I, it's just a great part of the story. And I, and Again, as long and the short, the answer is uh, for all the listeners, go read the book. Uh, we we'll, we'll want you to be spoiled. <laughs> but as a kind of a final question on this, did and this is more purely instead of talking about the story, it's more just my own curiosity leading me here. Did it make you reframe and look on your? I always find, particularly for uh, authors, that writing a book is extraordinarily educational on particular subject matters, particular topics. Um, and, you know, the, instead of the uh, the boring question of what do you want readers to get out of this book, I always like say, go read the book and find out for yourself. Uh, what did the book teach you particularly? And, and on this particular end point about how we view parents and lives of parents and the fact that parents are their own human beings, uh, what did this book teach you? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess like... Um... It's on the whole kind of just that like everyone, parents or not parents, just people are, you know, kind of layered and nuanced and there's always more to someone than you might think. Mm. Um, so um, so the, the way that somebody reacts, yeah, for example, the mother being extremely strict or even like, you know, in our kind of wider lives, like, yeah, people who react in certain ways to certain situations. Um, there's pretty much always, like, a story behind it. There's always a reason. And, like, people, you know, they don't just do things, like, mm. for the sake of it. Yeah. The, I, the, the, the subtext I always found off the back of it was sometimes there is the whole notion that you've got to grow up young or something quickly if something significant happens or if you come from a certain background. I, the, the thing I really picked up about from this is sometimes that you can be, you know, a young person who has lived and experienced a lot more than they probably could have or should, uh, you should have for for someone of their age. Um, but sometimes there is some things that you cannot fully understand until you have actually lived and experienced people was kind of how, was something that I really picked up from that. Um, because Leeling had such a has such a specific environment in this migrant setting, there is that can frame and paint you in in so many certain ways at a time when you were growing up. But I think this whole other core part, not just with going back to to Gigi with her lifestyle and her environment and the world that she's in, then bringing it back to 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 the mother. I, I just I just realized because. You know, being a when you're an adult, you now you have a different relationship with your parent, and you have a different connection with your parent, and sometimes you don't see that, and you cannot have that perspective until just time has passed, uh, mm. which I think is very interesting uh, and a great something really interesting to examine that I haven't, uh, you know, stopped to consider before, uh, which yeah. is really great. That, that it's really great when a book does that. Oh. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, like, um, I think like that's quite interesting in in the context of the book because I guess Layling has a lot of people keep telling her, "Oh, you'll understand when you're older. You'll understand when mm. you're older," and she gets really sick of hearing it. But yes. it is true that a yes. lot of things we just don't see them until we're older. <laughs> mm. It's suddenly it makes it makes more sense because mm. you then develop the tools to understand. Mm, um, mm. which which sometimes can only just come with time. I want to I do want to keep poking about the book, but I also do want to ask a little bit about this creative writing experience because as alluded to earlier in the, in the podcast, you you wrote this manuscript, you were with this manuscript for a while, you, you submitted it to 100 million places, it didn't <laughs> it wasn't successful, and then somehow out of nowhere uh, Penguin said yes and you won the Penguin Literacy Prize. And I always like hearing about how books come together because they're never, it's never a silo. It never happens in isolation. It's a very collaborative process. 
Um, but because I have someone who won a literacy prize, <laughs> Lex, um, how did that influence the crafting of the actual story? Um, well, I guess like maybe we should yeah rewind a little bit because I um because <laughs> <laughs> I I mostly wrote the book through um the Kelly Darling's mentors program. Mm, um, yes. So yeah. So um, shout out to my mentor Melanie Cheng because um like. I really don't think that this book would have existed without that program. It's um so the way it works is like you you get paired with a mentor and um for six months you kind of work with them and you have like monthly deadlines to meet. So I think it's something like ten thousand words a month. Um and so like having those deadlines for one like really helped because I, I had to like write that amount. Like it's pretty easy, especially like with novels. Um, to like kind of procrastinate and not write because you don't have something like pushing you. Um, mm. so those deadlines really, really helped. Um, but then also like the fact that I could kind of sit with Mel and talk to her about like the story and various plot points and um, mm. like it, it definitely wouldn't exist in the form that it is now like without her because yeah, I obviously had no idea what I was doing. Um, and <laughs> she she was kind of like, oh, you know, you know, you should like shape it like this. Like, you know, novels kind of have like tend to have like this sort of trajectory. Um, and like, yeah, and, and all of that kind of became like the book that it is. And so, so at the end of that mentorship, um, that manuscript was sort of what I was shopping around. And then, so as far as I'm like my actual um, publication journey within Penguin, um, we sort of had like a structural edit. Um, so structurally it was pretty, it hasn't changed too much because um, it's pretty linear. Um, but one of the big things was that because um, it was set in 1999, um, I was trying to make it kind of realistic with like, the time, you know, would people have spoken like this at that time? Um, mm. Sort of what was happening in the like broader kind of um, like political landscape as well. Um, then like the the more kind of micro things like um, making sure that her violin lessons were regular and that like yeah. her, her school schedule and um, that they had like things like term holidays at school and that sort of thing because it was set it's set over like one school year. Mm. Um, and then kind of after that, we did the copy edit process where um, we were kind of like tightening like the sentence structure and the flow. Um, and like a, a lot of what I learned was um, about um, avoiding repetition. So like apparently Leiling used to mumble a lot. So I hope that like she's, she's not mumbling as much now. <laughs> <laughs> or like, or rather, I've managed to <laughs> find other ways of expressing that. Mm. Um, yeah, but yeah, um, again, um, some really great um, people helped me out there. So um, Meredith Kerner and um, Melissa Lane at Penguin Random House, uh, are excellent editors who were um, like absolutely integral to making the book like as polished and um, as. Uh, I don't know, as, as literary as it is now. Do you absolutely endorse things like the mentor, like the Kill Your Darlings mentorship? Yeah. And what, like, what is the one thing I think you could say to say to someone like who probably has, has ever looked at that and gone, you know, maybe I want to try it, or maybe I want to sit with, sit with this manuscript in my own headspace for a little while. Maybe, I, maybe, you know, what what would you be, you know, your one piece of advice to someone who might be considering? I've got this idea and I want to do it in the mentorship. Mm. What do I do? Well, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess everyone is different, but um, I felt that the mentorship like really, really helped me because um, I didn't like, I'm a little bit of a procrastinator. I don't think I would have <laughs> written, <laughs> written <Preach>. for those <laughs> <websites. laughs> It's true. <laughs> Um, yeah, like I don't think I really could have like put out that many words in that amount of time um, without it. Um, 
and then yeah also having someone who was like so deeply invested in your story and who knew like what you wanted to achieve and what your characters were doing and um and who who really kind of yeah cared about it as much as you do mm. like I think that yeah those things are really really important and I just in general don't feel that there are as many um I mean I may be wrong but I, I don't feel that there are as many kind of initiatives for like writing a manuscript. There's a lot of things, like a lot of prizes for like unpublished manuscripts, but it's like to get to the stage of having an unpublished manuscript is is a, a massive feat in itself. Yes. So mm. I, I, I like I really endorse that program because I just, I don't really know of many other things like it that kind of help you get to the point of having like a finished manuscript. Mm. Like I think it's t the more I hear about mentorships, the more I'm like, far out. I should do that for my next book. God, because <laughs> <laughs> you could just pick up so much uh, knowledge and experience through just sitting with with authors who've just had more time in the saddle and would be such mm. a valuable, um, a valuable skill set. Yeah. What What is next? For you, what do we? Is there another book? Is it just a case of seeing how this one goes? What will we? What will we see next? Um, I'd love to write another book. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I guess I haven't really kind of um, sat down and, and kind of thought one out enough. Like I guess I've got like some thoughts about like themes and things, but it's all very very loose. Um, mm -hmm. And I am, of course, excited to see uh, how Jane and Emerald goes. So um, I don't know if that will necessarily affect like whether or not I want to write another book, but it it will just be an interesting experience. It being my first book and everything. Well, it, it's I love that where there's always that there's like something sitting there in the grey space that hasn't fully yeah. formed. It's yeah. like, oh, you're there again. <laughs> I know. <Yeah. laughs> That's how it feels. You again, I'm waiting for you to come exactly. out of the mist and reveal yourself to me. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Whatever happens next, um, you should be super proud of this book. It's uh, Jaden Emerald is fantastic, and um, so much to to dig into and digest and examine. And I really think that readers will absolutely enjoy it. We'll finish off with a last section, which is what I like to call the rapid fire part of the podcast. So I just fling a bunch of questions at you and <laughs> you give me the first answer that comes to your head. Um, so two, one or two of them I have given you time to prepare for, which is of course around books. Mm -hmm. um, which and, and the first question I want to ask you is, what is your favorite book that you have read in the last 12 months? Yes, I did have to think about this a little bit because there, <laughs> there are so many good ones. Um, uh, I'm a fan by Sheena Patel. Um, so uh yeah uh she's british i think um but yeah it's it's um in short it's kind of a story of like a a young a young woman uh who sort of has an affair with a married man but um there's also so much more to it than that um it's it's really like brutally on a satire about kind of the experience of being online or like um, there's a lot of kind of internet stalking um, and there's a lot of um, satire about kind of just like modern life. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, things like kind of wokeness or like capitalism or um, the, the appearance of that and how well, we kind of, um, uh, we mould our lives to, yeah, to, I don't know, fit Instagram. <laughs> Mm. I love how I love cynical uh, examinations mm. of uh, of the online space. Having worked, having working in the online space, uh, it is yeah. ripe for criticism. I will not yeah. I will simply <laughs> say it is. That. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite debut novel that you have ever read? So we're talking across your entire life. Someone who was there, it was their very first book that they ever read, and you picked it up and went, "Holy hell, what is this?" Yeah, this is a really hard one as well. <laughs> um, I'm, I might say um, Kokomo by Victoria Hen. Um, uh, speaking of books with parents who had lives before they were parents. Um, yes, very. Yeah, yeah. Very appropriate. Um, mm, that kind of um, like yeah, mother daughter story where yeah, um, 
the mother's actions are explained by things that the daughter doesn't understand or doesn't know about. Um, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, the emotions in that book are so raw. Um, and it's also, it's really empathetic as well. So kind of, you know, anyone who's going through something, you mm -hmm. really kind of get, get this insight into the characters. Um, and That's a yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. great book. It's mm -hmm. a great book, Kakuma. Um, it was remember it was all the buzz when it when it when it came out and it was <laughs> for good reason it was a it was a fantastic story do you have a favorite word word um yeah a specific word i'm really not sure <laughs> <laughs> well we could reframe it and say is there for example like in your book there's always one word that you use too much and the editor probably says to you dude you gotta take that out uh or you use it like so many times was there a particular example um, well, yeah, as I said, um, there was a lot of mumbling. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was, um, there was also a lot of, um, flinching. Yeah, I, I do quite like, um, the, the kind of, um, expression of fear through, like, a flinch. Mm. Um, yeah, and, yeah, so, um, yeah, my editor was like, yeah, you've used this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is still some, but not as much as there was. <laughs> oh, I love it, and mm -hmm. and also flinching. You, you, there's you can so much you can connect to it and do on that. And mm -hmm. yes, Paul, Paul really does flinch a lot in this book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <Yeah. laughs> there are so many. Um, I love all of the increased. There's the more more books coming out of, um, you know kind of not just based on the migrant experience, but coming out from authors from a migrant background, um, as mentioned, the albatross, of course, yourself. Is there a particular writer, um, whether it be Chinese Malaysian background um, or someone else uh, in who that you like have like think everyone should really check this person out you're sleeping on them? Melanie Cheng, who is um, uh, her background is um, she's, from Hong Kong that she uh, mostly grew up in Australia as well. Um, like her writing is great. Um, Alice Pung also. Oh yes. Of, um, yeah. yeah. Lovely writing. Um, and was literally the editor of the book called Growing Up Asian in Australia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which you should read. That's a great book actually. That's <laughs> a really, great. really good book. Mm. Um, I, I've got, I, I'll throw one as well into the mix, which is, um, a Japanese writer, Miko Kawakami, she wrote um, Breasts and Eggs that came out in yeah. 2019, but it's just a really um, amazing story. And I'm, I've become obsessed with Japanese storytelling in the last 12 months, um, whether it be authors or through um, the, uh, you know, other, other forms of it, like filmmaking, manga, whatever it may be, uh, just you check more of those writers out as well. They're also phenomenal. Um, do you have a favourite trope? Oh, um, well, I do like, yeah, it's an unlikely friendship kind of story. Um, mm. I, I also really love the old sad girl novel. <laughs> 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 Sad girl novels work. They do. Yeah, they right. really do. <laughs> they work for a reason. It's fire. Uh, absolutely. And then last question. Obviously, there's coming, growing up or coming of age stories have been done a lot. You have now completed one of your own. Um, <laughs> and I know you probably would have been familiar with a lot of other books that deal with that growing up and coming of age experience. Is there a part of that experience now that you've kind of do dove into the nooks and crannies of writing a story like that that you think hasn't been covered or something that should be re-examined or recontextualized? Hmm. Um, I mean, I'm sure there... I'm sure it probably does exist, but... Um, I would be interested in seeing, um, a, you know, kind of a bit more of a, a migrant story that has um, like a more positive relationship with the parents because um, they mm. definitely do exist. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, yeah, but I, I do feel like a lot of the time it's kind of, it is kind of written as like, yeah, parent versus child. Um, 
but it, mm. it would be nice to see yeah more kind of um yeah so it's like positive relationships mm. it's it's it, it it there's uh, it's hard to do that because because often that tension is often so built on it but yeah mm. maybe maybe mm. we should another idea maybe a sequel yeah. <laughs> I don't know how you'd I don't know how you'd weave that together, but woohoo. <laughs> um, Michelle, this has been so much that fun. Thank you for uh, for gifting us with this book and thank you so much for coming on date with a debut. It has been a pleasure chatting to you. Oh thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Date With A Debut and for listening to the Words and Nerds channel. You can buy all books mentioned in today's episode down in the description box. And if you enjoyed the show or indeed any episode of Words and Nerds, drop us a review, leave us five stars or a thumbs up. It is hugely appreciated. Catch you soon.